Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movie That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. At last, at last, 20 years after the fact, we have a sequel to Independence Day, a gloriously cheesy B-movie from the dawn of digital effects that birthed everything from the superstardom of Will Smith to the tradition of monument-destroying spectacle that continues to permeate summer movies to this day. Hi there, X-Men Apocalypse! That original film has aged pretty well when you take it as a guilty pleasure popcorn movie populated by a few loony cliched characters fumbling their way towards victory that gleefully laid waste to entire cityscapes before 9-11 made such imagery decidedly less fun. Now, 20 years later, Independence Day Resurgence returns to this world with as much tendency to take hard left turns off the deep end of credulity as the first one had, but with results that are far less uh, fun. There are some fun moments here, especially in the last half, but not enough to recommend it, even as a guilty pleasure. And that is something I find myself very disappointed to report. That's it for the capsule review. Let's get in depth. All right, where do I even begin with this one? All right, you know what? I'm just going to wing it. For about the first 45 minutes of this movie, virtually nothing interesting happens. This sequel doesn't contain as many of the fun, sarcastic, or joyful characters like Dennis Quaid or Will Smith. As a result, the first chunk of Independence Day Resurgence must take great pains to introduce the new crop of pretty bland characters being introduced to the franchise, explain who they are, and place them into position for the fireworks at the end. And I mean explain who they are. This is the type of dumbed-down writing that has Jeff Goldblum meet up with a female scientist engage in some awkward flirting, as only Jeff Goldblum can do, and then as they walk away have another character basically state to another one, as if we couldn't get it. Uh, they sort of have a history. Yeah, we got it. This is a movie in which one character who will stay with the action throughout the entire movie is an IRS agent who has tracked down Jeff Goldblum in order to perform an audit, and when the fit hits the shan, so to speak, hops onto a spaceship with Jeff Goldblum simply because he wants to complete the man's paperwork. That's right, one of our main characters in the action of this movie is an IRS accountant, and he is paired in an almost buddy movie scenario with an African warlord. Ludicrous! Want more? I got more! This is a movie where, hey, just like the first one, anyone, and I mean anyone with flying experience, can simply just take a plane from a military base, or in this case, a spaceship, and just take off on personal business, just steal a plane. Even the President of the United States can just join the life-threatening mission and fly straight into battle, remember? And everyone's just like, oh, that guy. We told him not to be a part of this mission, but by gum, it looks like we're gonna have to let him do it. Bill Pullman is back, and he's playing a grizzled, addled old man whose brain is still fried from being in an alien mind mill from the first movie, and he's back up to his usual shenanigans, taking matters into his own hands, acting on his own, and in one inexplicable scene, he begins having a conversation in an airplane hangar with Jeff Goldblum. He starts talking, then it turns into sort of a speech, and then he begins to notice that everyone around him has stopped and is just listening to him, and then the music swells up, and before you know it, they're trying to do another version of his rousing speech from the first film. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, I really don't think they realize how terribly cheesy this is. Or do they? There are just so many times, especially during the last half, that I found myself laughing, not at a joke or a one-liner, but at the sheer ridiculousness of what was happening on screen. I mean full-throated, deeply enjoyable mocking laughs. It kind of sounded like this. <laughs> I was doing that laugh through the entire back half of this movie. <laughs> and I'll tell you, that's when the movie kicked into another gear. I was throwing things at the screen, yelling, get out of here, really loudly, and making this laugh over and over. The fun section starts when the first major attack happens and the aliens, flying a ship that is so massive it has its own gravity, they pick up the city-state of Singapore and drop it on London. I'll repeat that, and when I do, take a look at a globe if you got one handy. They pick up Singapore and drop it on London. Ludicrous! Ludicrous! It doesn't stop there, oh no. About midway through the film, we we're introduced to a car full of orphaned kids who, and this is so transparent, they only appear in this movie so that the story can do a complicated set of gymnastics to put those kids, and only those kids, on a school bus driving straight into the main military battle with the alien hordes in the big finale. The weird part is, by that point I didn't even care. By then, I had given up on taking the film even remotely seriously, 
those bland characters, the new blood characters, started to become kind of fun and quippy, and the booming IMAX 3D action got my pulse racing, and I was awed by a lot of the cool digital and practical icky alien effects. One thing I found particularly interesting was that the first movie was definitely set in our world. It was our world plus aliens. Now, Resurgence is set in a world that is less recognizable by far. It's our world 20 years after getting our hands on alien technology. Futuristic pulse weapons, cold fusion, moon milk? The world in Resurgence is vastly different and the little details are fun to notice. So then, was Independence Day Resurgence enough fun as a piece of escapist trash? I don't know, it's sort of a tough call. I went back and forth on this one for a while, and I tend to give the guilty pleasures a medium bag of popcorn. However, I don't think guilty pleasure is the right term for this garbage fire. Small bag of popcorn for this. It's a, it's a shameful pleasure. If you can stick out the first boring hour and then embrace the ridiculousness quickly, you will get some pleasure from it, but you will almost immediately be ashamed of that fact. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop, and click the icon right down there to visit our channel. You'll be able to view all of our other videos, and more importantly, click subscribe, so you can keep up with all the latest episodes, and so we can keep doing what we do. Please leave your comments below, and click the thumbs up if you like what you heard. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and don't worry, we're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. Woo!